Good afternoon. I'm David Russell, Director of the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at the Brookings Institution. It's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon to a discussion about the role that the banks have played during the COVID crisis and the response of their regulators. As we know, the pandemic and the shutdown of the economy had a significant effect on financial markets and on banks. We expect banks to play a key role in channeling credit, including from the government, to businesses and households, both to ameliorate the pain of the recession and to help quicken the return to a more normal economy as the pandemic recedes and the economy gradually reopens. To support banks' ability to do this, regulators have urged them to use their capital and liquidity buffers and have eased some capital requirements. But what we ask today basically is what vulnerabilities has this very real life stress test exposed? Are banks meeting our expectations? Are they strong enough to keep lending through what's likely to be a very difficult economic recovery? Or should they be cutting dividends or share repurchases now, or even raising new equity so they're ready? What have we learned from the behavior of banks about the costs and benefits of Dodd-Frank and the other reforms we put in place after the Great Recession? Are there longer term risks to financial stability if regulatory forbearance is extended? A week ago, we focused on the financial markets. Today, we focus on the banks. And we're very fortunate to have an extremely uh, impressive group of people to discuss. We're gonna start off with um, a presentation by Jeremy Stein of Harvard We'll discuss a paper that he's written with Sam Hansen, Addie Sunderham, and Michael Blank of the Harvard Business School. After Jeremy presents, my colleague Nellie Lang will join the co-authors for a brief discussion of the paper. And then we'll have some reactions to the paper and to the bigger issues that are on the table from Betsy Duke, formerly uh, Federal Reserve Board Governor and former Chairman of Wells Fargo, Don Cohn, my colleague at Brookings, former vice chair of the Federal Reserve, and Andrew Metrick of uh, the Yale School of Management. And so with that, I'd like to turn the screen and the, the podium over to Jeremy Stein. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks very much, David. Let me see if I can share my screen here. Okay. Um, Okay, thanks, thanks again, and it's a pleasure to, to be here. As David said, I'm gonna talk about some joint work with my colleagues, Michael Blank, Sam Hansen, and Adi Sundaram. And basically we're trying to address the, the question in the title, how should regulators respond to the pandemic? And to give you the short answer up front, uh, our view is more forcefully than they have done so far. Um, just to put this in context, uh, my view is that, the, and I think our view is that the Fed's overall response to the pandemic has been generally outstanding. They've been appropriately aggressive, imaginative, willing to push the envelope. Uh, I think they've been in, you know, in, in all cases equal to the moment, um, except strikingly um, in, in, in bank regulation where it feels like they've been somewhat uh, too passive and, and, and behind the curve. So, Basically, I'm going to attempt to, in the next few minutes, make that case a little bit more uh, explicitly. So just to break things up, spend a minute or so on kind of what we learned from last time around, uh, say a few things about what the market seems to be telling us this time. We've done a very crude little homemade stress test of our own. We'll let you know what, what, what that has had to say. Um, a little bit on kind of what should one do in principle in a time of stress and wrap up with some very specific uh, policy recommendations. So, um, you know, very simple point is we've kind of seen this, um, we've kind of seen this movie before. Um, between 2007, uh, quarter one and 2008, quarter two. So this is the pre-Lehman, but problems are already underway, period. US banks paid out $136 billion in cash and repurchases. They did minimal, um, issuance of new public equity and waited and basically waited and waited and waited even as several hundred billion dollars of loan losses were accumulating in the system didn't really do uh, meaningful issuance of public equity um, until uh, mid-2009 after the original stress test the so-called uh, SCAP and by that time um, their stock prices were down sort of ballpark 70 percent 
Um, second point is um, stock prices were all along sort of telling a story and were more forward looking than the sort of traditional accounting based uh, measures that, that, that one looks at to judge capital adequacy. So even by March of 2008, around the time of Bear Stearns, um, bank stock prices were down by 35%. But again, that was a period of essentially no action um, on the part of banks um, and their regulators. And at least in hindsight, that feels to us like it was a major, a major policy uh, mistake and a missed opportunity to raise equity and to stop dividends at a time when prices were higher and it didn't have to have been done uh, sort of, you know, in the shadow of government, uh, government putting equity and, and, you know, people worrying about nationalization. Uh, just to follow on this point, not only were bank stock prices declining sharply, they seem to be sort of informative. So none of us are trying to push market efficiency too far here. But if you look at the cross section of which banks stocks fell the most, that was a very good predictor of which banks ultimately had the biggest loan losses. So that's what this graph is telling you. Those banks whose stocks went down the most had later on, whose stocks went down the most pre-Lehman, ultimately realized the biggest loan losses. And in fact, um, there was much more information in stock prices than in, again, accounting-based measures such as change in, in capital ratio. So again, making the case that stock prices, you know, well, albeit noisy, do, do seem to have some useful and importantly at, at, at sort of turning points like this forward-looking information. Okay, what are they telling us this time around? Well, you know, bank stocks, again, we look quite similar in some ways to the sort of pre-Lehman, call it Bear Stearns spring of 2008 period. Bank stocks are down 40%. And in that sense, they're quite distinct uh, from the rest of the market, which has rallied quite strongly. Um, so again, if you, and if you look at which banks have fallen the most, it doesn't seem to be random. It seems to be the banks with um, the most exposure to risky loans, and in particular to C&I and consumer loans as the most, uh, as the sort of strongest signal. So there seems to be, again, some information there corroborated um, by other market uh, prices. If you look at indexes, uh, for example, leveraged loans, those are down around 10%. Uh, try to reconstruct essentially an indicator of CMBS prices. Those are down 9%. And of course, those have rallied. This is after that, them having rallied on, on the heels of Fed uh, support for credit markets. So that's sort of inclusive of, of the Fed put. They're still down um, kind of substantially. Okay. Um, you know, market prices are one piece of information. We try, and of course, this is very, very crude, we tried to do a little homemade stress test. What we did is we took, and this is um, with thanks to uh, researchers at the Minneapolis Fed, they have a model that basically allows you to feed in macroeconomic assumptions. And then based on historical relationships between macroeconomic variables and category level loan losses, spits out estimates of, of loan losses. So for example, we feed in an unemployment rate and based on the historical relationship between unemployment and say CNI loan losses, it will spit out um, estimates of CNI loan losses. Okay, so again, we feed in the main thing that, that drives this. There's also uh, various real estate, commercial, residential real estate prices. The simple heuristic here, the primary driver of our analysis is unemployment. Okay, now I should say there's an enormous caveat because as you'll see, the path of the unemployment rate looks very different than in past history. It's likely to spike much, much higher, but it may be a more temporary and sort of more hump-shaped spike than we've seen in the past. And of course, the data, you know, the model can only extrapolate based on past history. So please take everything that we say here with an enormous grain of salt. The point is not to make a precise estimate, it's to get sort of broad, broad magnitudes, okay? So again, a bit of a black box, I know, given, um, given the time, but the most optimistic scenario we consider is one where the unemployment rate peaks at 17.8%. And obviously that's probably short of, you know, this is not an extremely adverse scenario at this point. This is probably short of where we'll be. Even in that relatively more optimistic scenario, um, banks will have a net hit to their um, uh, uh, equity uh, tier one capital of about 400 billion and their capital ratio will fall from 11.5% to 7.3%.
So a little over 400 basis points. If we go more pessimistic, um, and this is sort of the pessimistic case that Minneapolis has, has sketched out, obviously you get um, sort of more, more substantial numbers. Okay, again, I don't think we're particularly trying to push a point estimate here, but to suggest that for plausible magnitudes, you can get quite, quite substantial effects. Um, here's a picture of some of what we've done. I'd like to draw your attention to the right-hand panel over here, just to show you that what's going on inside this black box is not crazy implausible. So the blue line is in our most optimistic case, what is the model telling you about losses, for example, on residential real estate, loss rate of only 2%. So in fact, this scenario, our so-called optimistic scenario is, if anything, quite a bit gentler on residential real estate than we had in the global financial crisis. Another just sort of sanity check, the loss rates, depending on how adverse the scenario for CNI loans are between five and 10%. The upper end there conforms with what market prices, again, of leveraged loans seem to be telling us. So while this is a bit of a black box, it doesn't seem to be generating you know, loss numbers that feel, um, feel crazy. Another kind of interesting bit of validation is if you think, well, one thing to look at is market prices, another thing to look at is the stress test, they line up very closely with one another in the cross section. So in other words, on the horizontal axis I've got here, how much has the stock price of a particular bank declined and how much on the vertical axis has their uh, the CET1 capital ratio moved. And you can see there's a very, very close association. Basically what's going on banks like Ally Cap One discover that are more consumer centric. Have the stock market has recognized that apparently and has hit them harder. And our stress tests basically are hitting them harder as well. That's a loan category that's sensitive to high unemployment rate. So again, none of this tells us that the magnitudes are precisely right, but it at least has some, some modest feeling of, of cross-validation, okay? Um, so that's sort of the numerical analysis. What should one in principle do at a time like this when there's been a major shock to bank capital? Obviously, you want to protect the banking system while at the same time encouraging uh, credit supply. And we've done some previous work on this. And I think there's sort of an intuitive principle, which is you want to work simultaneously on two margins. You want to simultaneously lower the marginal tax rate, if you will, on new lending. That is like lowering the capital charge or the capital ratio that is applied to new loans. That's one thing. But at the same time, you want more dollars of equity. Those two together will both bolster the system and create more capacity uh, for, for lending. Um, and I think that's very much the, the lesson that we learned. And it was, I think, the, the fundamental insight of the 2009 SCAP where if you'll recall, we were not telling Bank of America, improve your capital ratio by 2%. We were telling Bank of America, raise $30 billion of new capital. So that's a very important part of the response. And by analogy to taxation, you know, this is sort of like simultaneously saying, we want to cut the marginal tax rate because we want to encourage more desirable activity. But at the same time, we want to broaden the base and maintain our revenues, not, not deplete revenues. And if you look at the US policy res response thus far, it's been entirely essentially focused on the loosening the ratio type of requirements. That is to say, cutting the marginal cost of making a new loan, but it hasn't done the other part, which, which again, we think is a very important and perhaps the more important um, part, of the overall, um, part of the overall response. So just to summarize, uh, I think we have a pretty, pretty simple um, bottom line in the short run, uh, I think this is as close as you get to a no-brainer that um, bank dividends and share repurchases should be halted immediately. Uh, the U.S. is something of an outlier in not having done this already. A number of other countries have. Um, maybe a bit more challengingly, but we think also importantly, um, if you think about, you know, it's no fun to issue equity when your stock price is down 40. But there is a scenario, and the global financial crisis teaches us, there's a scenario 
where you know things get better, but there's also one where it gets worse. And I think you want to think about the cost of mistakes on either side and the cost of having to issue when you're down 70 and you need government support to do it is, uh, I, I think we would judge as a substantial cost. So, so that's our second thing. Um, more broadly, I think this time around, as of last time, has taught us about the value, uh, especially at these turning points of looking to market information uh, for some guidance. That's not to say that we wanna mechanically tie capital requirements to market prices, but there should be some discipline as we've tried to illustrate here between if you're, if you're thinking about a stress test uh, or if you're thinking about capital needs and stock prices are down very dramatically, you should be trying to at least reconcile the, the two pieces of information with, 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 with one another. Um, if we had previously raised the so-called counter cyclical buffer, we would be in a position to cut it now, which would be the other thing that we think is useful is to lower the marginal uh, capital tax. Unfortunately, it was not turned on in the US and you can think of sort of various political economy reasons why that's challenging. I think we think that setting the default, so there's a presumption that it's basically on in good times would make you, uh, you know, would give you a better shot uh, at having the scope to, to lower it um, in bad times. So that's pretty much it. I will stop here and then we're gonna, I'm gonna turn it over to our Q and A, which will be led by Nellie Lang and we're gonna be joined by uh, Sam, Adi, and Michael. Uh, thank you very much. Terrific. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Um, Sam, Adi, Michael, for this paper. Very interesting um, and an interesting set of proposals. Um, so I'm going to pose a couple of questions, focusing first on the short term and probably mostly on the short term recommendations. Um, and this will sort of give you a little time to sort of bring out the a little bit more of the richness of the paper that you can only do so much in 10 minutes. Okay. So you introduced this as the Fed has done very, been very forceful and aggressive on all kinds of actions, monetary policy and emergency liquidity, and has not been as aggressive on the bank regulatory side. Um, I think the Fed could say they've been put, they've put in place a system to anticipate this type of situation. Uh, they have stress tests, which are tailored to individual firms that incorporate the proposed dividends and share repurchases that might be paid out and so that's already built into the capital requirements that they have for individual banks. And until now, that's include dividends and share repurchases, as you know, although they're moving to a system where it looks like it'll be only dividends. Um, can you just explain or just uh, express a little bit more, why isn't the current system enough? Sure, um, maybe I'll, I'll start. So, um, and thank you very much for for hosting this great event. Um, you know, I think just to to start at a high level, our view is that you want to, and our comparative advantage is starting with the substance and then asking how the process can be used to implement that substance. And, you know, that a very very high level, I think the substance is this is a completely unprecedented shock that no one anticipated three months ago, let alone six months ago, let alone 12 months ago. And so um, though the stress tests from 2019 are admirable in many ways, uh, through no fault of their own, uh, regulators were not anticipating a worldwide pandemic and the corresponding kind of economic destruction. Um, and therefore, um, what we did in the past is probably not uh, enough given the size of the shock. The other thing I just like to say up front is that, you know, um, we should be, I think a thing we're learning from this is that the stress test is almost like it's becoming a commitment that may not, that may constrain us from taking actions in response to a shock. So this is kind of like the problems that people have had with the dot plots and monetary policy on steroids. <laughs> um, that, you know, uh, I announced that we were, I announced six months the banks were fine. 
though the world has completely changed, I feel a little constrained to continue saying that the banks are fine. Um, whereas, you know, I guess our view is that it should be pretty reasonable for people in the process to say, um, the world changed pretty dramatically and like, let's use the tools that the process has set up to understand how to respond to that dramatic change um, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Just to follow up on that, I mean, we've come sort of an interesting long way from 2009. If you think about the original stress test, it was like, oh my gosh, you know, uh, obviously the accounting numbers are not telling us the story. Right. We need to do something that will mark us to the current reality to some extent and allow us to do what we need to do in sort of a crisis. Then we went through this period of the stress test becoming a kind of, you know, normalized thing and a kind of compliance exercise to some extent. And it's fine, it seems to me fine to say when you're doing whatever the 2019 stress test, let's have a hypothetical scenario where you can continue to pay dividends for nine quarters. It seems um, kind of crazy that you would then say that you're locked into that. Right. I mean, it seems to right. completely undermine the whole point of doing a stress test, which is, uh, you know, again, this was originally a wartime tool. And if we turn it into, it's nice to use the, the army and have the army do exercises in right. peacetime. time. But if those peacetime exercises end up compromising your ability to use it for what was, I think, its original and most uh, valuable mm -hmm. purpose, that would be a kind of right. unfortunate. So, um, yeah. yeah. So can you clarify, does your proposal, which is to immediately halt dividends and share repurchases, um, until, so there's two questions here. One is, would it be all firms halt dividends and share repurchases regardless of their capital levels? And then until when? Um, I don't know if you've kind of gone through that process yet, but just can you, can you address that? Well, I would say for sure all. Um, mm -hmm. you, know, you want to take the signaling sting to some extent out of this. Um, and it's just a preemptive, uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's across the board. So it's not like if you start, if you get into signaling out individual banks, I think that's right. Right. more problematic. Um, you know, also, also, you know, given the shape of the current shock last time in the global financial crisis, the shock mainly had impacted the very largest banks. This time we don't have, you know, we, we you know, some small or mid-sized banks are also they they make uh, many commercial, you know, commercial industrial yeah. loans, commercial real estate loans. So I think that there's less a sense at this time, for instance, that it should only be concentrated in the large banks. Um, yeah, Jeremy, I don't know if you had thoughts on, you know, if there was some automaticity. Um, I mean, w one simple point would be that, you know, I mean, I think you would you would want to, for precautionary reasons, shut off dividends and repurchases until you were relatively sure, given the shape of the shock and the capitalization of the banks, that you knew pretty well that they were going to be able to survive. You know, it, it mm -hmm. seems like the presumption mm -hmm. the presumption should be we let's be cautious until we're really sure that we're going to be able to weather the storm, right. as opposed to let's pay dividends until we're sure that we need more equity. Yes. And, again, and so I, just to add on that, you know, I think survive. In other words, I don't think you're doing this just to prevent, you know, the worst case scenario where the banks need to be rescued by the government or in danger of failing. We have a financial system that we're going to need when we come out on the other side of this to be able to supply credit to the real economy. And it's quite possible that the other non-bank parts of the financial system, which have been playing a very, very heavy role in corporate credit, will be damaged in some way. Um, so some of this is just having a stronger banking system so it can re-intermediate and continue, uh, right. continue to provide credit. You know, even if you're down three or 400 basis points of capital, uh, and you're not in danger of failing, that puts a pretty significant dent in your ability to, to expand uh, uh, credit. Yeah, I agree. Your, your point about dy a dynamic resilient framework focuses on both reducing probability of failure and supporting lending to the economy. And that's an important element. Um, could you speak to what you think this might do to banks' cost of equity capital, this type of regime? 
So I think of this regime as almost, not quite, but turning CCYB on its head, um, where you try to raise capital early when capital is relatively cheap and you can release it. And that's part of your framework. But there's also this piece that you have a shock big enough and now you need to raise capital, which you could cut dividends or repurchases, but it may actually require new issuance. Um, so can you just talk about the cost of equity capital to banks and if there's a social cost to lower stock prices, which is kind of where I was thinking it might lead to. <laughs> so um, are there social costs other than private costs that we should be concerned about? Um, I mean, I guess the first thing as I, I would say, as, as Jeremy kind of said, I think we are big fans of, as we said, kind of two things. One is broadening the base or increasing the total dollars of equity in the banking system, while at the same time you are relaxing uh, capital ratio requirements, as exactly would be the case if you were kind of drawing down into a CC, uh, a counter cyclical capital buffer. So, um, so yeah, I think we're, we're, we're completely fine with allowing ratios to kind of fall below where we would like them to see in the normal steady state. But at the same time, yes, we do think there needs to be more dollars uh, of bank equity capital. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the social costs of, of bank equity uh, issuance or bank equity capital, I think, you know, um, I mean, I guess the first thing is, you know, there are, there's a very large corporate finance literature about, you know, what are, what happens to bank stock or what happens to stocks when you issue. And for the most part, yes, if you issue equity, your stock price does fall some, but it's not, it's not, it's certainly not uh, kind of the apocalyptic event that it seems like people often think it is. And then as we kind of argue in the yeah. paper, we think that, you know, a lot of the costs of issuing or raising equity are kind of private in nature. They do not represent costs to society. They mainly say are transfers from, uh, say, bank shareholders to bank creditors. Um, and, you know, I think the biggest kind of social cost of issuing equity that sometimes people will point to is that people will say, well, if the Fed asks banks to issue equity, it will scare the markets because it will kind of reveal some very negative information that the Fed has about the macro economy. I guess the point then that we would make is we think the Fed has been, um, you know, admirably forthright. In one, you know, the chairman's out uh, regularly talking about being concerned about there being kind of a tsunami of corporate defaults and household bankruptcies that could have very long lasting and scarring effects on the economy. Um, and, you know, has been issuing some pretty dire, uh, scary statements and acknowledging the tremendous uncertainty about, uh, about, about the macro economy. And for that reason, you know, as, as the chairman has recently said, the Fed has kind of uh, blown past what number, normally would be a bunch of red lines because of that. And I think the only thing we would say here is, unless we somehow think, you know, that bank in, that investors in bank stocks can be being told by top Fed officials that this could be a very, very severe, uh, you know, recession or even depression, um, and that there could be be you know significant bankruptcies. But the only somehow, the only thing that they haven't figured out is that banks, you know, make a lot of loans and could lose money if they're bankruptcies. It just, it just doesn't feel like there's much that that we can be keeping, you know. Uh, keeping secret from investors at this point, so. Okay. Um, we have probably a minute if anyone wants to wrap up or I have one more question, um, if anybody. So your proposal, so let me just raise this. Your proposal um, doesn't distinguish between dividends and share repurchases. Um, which is something the current stress test regime does. Um, it has recognized for better or for rightly or wrongly that dividends are more costly to cut in the sense of it's more costly to the stock price um, than share repurchases. And banks have ramped up share repurchases in a big way um, and not dividends over the past few years. Um, I've been a big proponent of cutting share repurchases, certainly for as long for at least the period that which the SLR has exempting treasuries. Um, do you see any role for 
why do you need, so let me just ask them, why do you need both? Are you certain you need both in your proposal? Or are you, is it, um, are you certain that the amounts that of capital that you need are necessary to ensure the markets are comfortable with the firms and they can continue to lend? Or is there a possibility of something intermediate? Would you? So, so one one observation, you know, it's, it's always been a mystery as you sort of alluded to in corporate finance. Why yeah, yeah. Both cash out the door, what's the difference? Totally, totally. To the extent that anybody has a theory of it, it's some kind of a signal. Like we sort of kind of promised we were going to keep dividends constant. So when we go back on that, that's a bad signal about the, the company in question. Now, of course, if the regulator imposes that on you, it's no longer a signal about the individual company in question. So I think that the argument that dividend cuts are more costly goes out the window, at least to some extent. Okay. Um, I take your point. Look, um, the amount of dividends we're talking about, I think is probably in the ballpark of 50 billion. It's mm -hmm. not as big as the repurchases. Yeah. I don't think it's sufficient. If you look at sort of the numbers we were showing in the stress test, I don't think it's sufficient. I think we're arguing for it on the principle of, man, you should at least do this because this seems like a relatively easy thing to do. Yeah. I think the four of us all believe that we need to go further. Um, and you know, if we want to have real magnitudes, we probably need to have you know multiple hundreds of billions of equity issues. Uh, if anything, like the downside scenario is is in the offing. Yeah. Um, and so I, there's no pretense that dividends are not, but they would be the first step along a path that I think um, you know we ought to we ought to be contemplating. And, and I mean, the, exactly to kind of Jeremy's point, the chatter that we've heard from bank executives is almost of the form, you know, if the Fed told everyone to cut their dividend, of course, we'd be happy to do it. Uh, it's just that we don't want to be the first right. bank to do it. Um, but yet the Fed kind of hasn't uh, taken that step. Okay, great. This is terrific. Thank you again for a very interesting paper. And we'll be coming back to this, I think, with the panelists um, that we're going to next all have some thoughts they want to share on this. And I think we'll be coming back to this discussion. So I'm going to turn now to Andrew Metrick from the Yale School of Management. He should be coming on. Hi, I really like the message that pops on the screen. It says you have been promoted. <laughs> very, it's very exciting. Uh, th thanks very much for uh, the invitation for this and, and for giving me the opportunity to look at this paper. Uh, it's a short paper, but it has a lot of, uh, I think, really good content. Um, my, my key takeaways that I got from, which won't I think, be any different than perhaps the conclusion slide that Jeremy just showed, is, is first, from, on the content side, the strong value of market information in how we should be thinking about our stress tests in general, that, that there's a lot of information that the market has that perhaps we're ignoring and, and that is to our detriment. And I think that's a very important point which we should be thinking about as we design our, our stress tests going forward. The second kind of a specific exercise and they call it a tabletop and there's lots of caveats about that tabletop, but I was struck by the fact that while the assumptions seem to me to be kind of conservative, conservative in the sense that they're not imposing really, really nasty economic scenarios compared to what we observe out there, the results were still pretty scary. Uh, it was still almost 80, in the adverse scenario, almost 80% of the bank, of 80% of, of bank assets were in banks that would be below their, their required capital ratio. And that, that to me is a alarm bells. That's kind of cause for concern. If that's what your tabletop is telling us, then we, we need to get more into, into that. And that, that most of my comments will be about that. Like what, what, not what should uh, uh, Jeremy, Sam, Adi, and Michael do. Uh, it's not yeah. their job to have all the data the Fed has, but what, what do we need the Fed to do to make the stress test credible? Uh, finally, there's a set of policy recommendations. And, um, you know, usually I really enjoy debating Jeremy about his policy recommendations. I like to disagree with him a hard time and all that. I, I find myself sadly agreeing with these policy recommendations. <laughs> I will not uh, engage, I will not uh, continue the debate, uh, perhaps others will, about whether we should stop them paying dividends now, and I agree. Um, instead, what I wanted to do was talk about another aspect of the stress tests, 
that I think is really important in, in their writings, uh, uh, Jeremy Sam and Adi in past papers as well have emphasized one very important part of the stress test that was a key insight in SCAP, which was the need to raise more dollars of capital to not, not just change ratios, but raise dollars. And that's a very important point. I think perhaps the, the, the twin pillars of what was so cool about the wartime SCAP stress test, that's one of those pillars. The second is how credible the test was. So, so the difference between the very successful stress test in the United States, successful meaning that markets really reacted very positively to it and it helped to end the disruption in short-term credit markets um, compared to what happened in Europe uh, with their first stress test was credibility. And, and uh, there's a bunch of different elements that go into making up a credible stress test. And I think that there are some danger signs that what we have, are going to see in our wartime stress tests here may not be credible. And I wanted to just uh, throw out a few things that I thought would be really necessary components of what our wartime stress tests will look like. I, I imagine you know, what the Fed is going to announce is what they're going to announce. They're not eagerly listening in on this call to see what they need to change for the one they announce soon. But perhaps going forward, you know, we can have this debate. So the first is that, um, it, it, and this is all framed by the fact that in, in the paper, you can see just looking at the class model, which of course is not the model that they're using on a, on a bank by bank basis, but gives you the idea. We're looking at the, the past to help us predict the future. And in the class model, the, the scenarios are so difficult that we're actually getting in some extreme cases, weird nonsensical results. Uh, and we have to override them. In the, in, just in this kind of basic model. And I'm sure that's going on in the more complicated models as well. We're gonna need something that at post when people read the fine print, they think is credible. So one piece that I think is important here, which I hope is not left out of our models is that banks are currently taking some of the losses in the economy that are happening through very, very necessary loan forbearance we are giving to people. When people don't pay their rent, when they don't pay their mortgage, when they don't have to pay some of their contracts, ultimately some of that is falling on the owners of the, the loans that are not getting paid at the end of this chain. And so it's not just uh, loan losses the way we would predict them in normal times. We are actually through policy setting up a variety of different ways now and probably more going forward where we're going to allow some of these loans that we're asking the banks that are well capitalized to do part of the rescue uh, for now. And we need to keep that in mind as we're thinking about what will things look like in six months. Second, um, the, the, the uh, adverse scenarios that we see here in the Minneapolis Fed, for example, and that you see in a lot of different places, I gotta say, they look way too much like a U or a V or whatever you wanna call it uh, to me. Uh, it, it, it does not seem credible that we don't have at least uh, some scenarios where this is a very long and protracted recovery. Uh, I'm not gonna go into all the details for it now, but I, I, I think it's quite clear that that is possible. And so just looking at what's gonna happen if, if we come right back, uh, I think is, is, not, is not particularly credible. And then finally, that, that, that bringing these together, I would say what we will need to have credible looking stress tests is underlying models slash scenarios that are more uh, paying more attention to the connection between what's going on on the biomedical side and what's going on on the economic side. We are starting to see some pretty good uh, models coming out of professional practitioners. Our friend Lou Alexander has a really nice one that's trying to bring together data uh, from what's happening in the virus what's happening in mobility and how that relates to economic activity. We're gonna need that. We're gonna need something more than just looking at the historical relationship between various macro things and uh, defaults to come up with reasonable looking forecasts for the path of these key macro variables and how they're gonna interact with loan losses and bank capital. And I think we're gonna need this. I think absent having my, you know, my, perhaps my largest concern right now is that with what the banks are being asked to do and with what an adverse scenario might look like, uh, a realistic adverse scenario, if this takes a long time to come out of it, that banks capital raising from the public on their own, on the private side is going to be insufficient for a variety of reasons. 
And that really, I don't know whether our political system is going to be capable of recapitalizing the banks, uh, uh, given the strong pushback that we received from doing it 10 years ago. And so I think right now we got to, well, before things get bad, do everything we can uh, to try to both preserve capital and establish a credible framework for evaluating our capital needs. I probably took more time than I was supposed to, but I let me shut up now and turn it over to Don Cohn. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be part of this panel. It's been really interesting so far. I have a couple of points I uh, want to make. If I could move the slides. Hmm. There we go. Uh, so I agree with the points that the paper makes and that Andrew just emphasized. So like Andrew and Adi, I think this could be a very severe stress event, even more severe than the Fed severe scenario. At least there's a fat tail out there and a pretty fat tail and the banks need to be resilient to that fat tail. They need to have enough resources to continue lending, to keep credit flowing, to reduce the scarring, a lot of which will happen, but even more of it will happen if the banks don't continue to lend. So I think conserving that capital, building the capital is key. I wanna spend my time on the next two points. There is a regime built around the dynamic resilience that uh, the authors have advocated. It's in the UK and I've been part of it as a member of the Financial Policy Committee. So I wanna review that. I also think that the US capital regime was moving in the wrong direction before the stress event. Capital requirements from the stress test had fallen. The framework was becoming less counter cyclical and unsurprisingly, and I'll explain why I think that, and unsurprisingly, I have a recommendation for them. So what have we been doing in the UK? Um, we, uh, for, for many years, for five years or so, we had a counter cyclical capital buffer that was set at one in a standard risk environment. Last year, we said we wanted to make it two in a standard risk environment. And we did it in part by looking as the authors did at the global financial crisis. And we could see that the buildup of capital before that crisis to make banks resilient would have been much larger than one or two, and that than one for sure. And we questioned whether we could have gotten the countercyclical buffer up to the three and a half to five that the staff uh, estimated we would have needed if we started from one. We might have trouble even having started from two, say in 2003 or four, but at least we'd have a better chance of getting it to where it needed to be to make the banking system resilient. Going from one to two in a steady state would have added a little bit to tier one capital requirements, about a quarter of a percentage point. It wasn't a big increase, but a little increase in the quality of capital. Our stress test in the Financial Policy Committee uh, helps us to decide on what the countercyclical capital buffer should be. Um, we, uh, as in the US, we, try, we make it countercyclical. So the lower the unemployment rate is, the bigger the increase in the unemployment rate. The higher property prices are, the greater the fall in property prices. We also look at the stress environment uh, or the financial environment, the risk environment globally. And in the past couple of years, our stress test has produced larger drawdowns in UK uh, capital, importantly because of our perception of rising global risk, including leverage in US businesses and leverage in, in, in China. We also believe that releasing the countercyclical capital buffer can be an effective macroprudential tool to enable and encourage banks to lend. 
I think the important point is that it adds to the amount of capital that can be drawn down before you get to a spot in the capital, uh, the capital stack in which you might be required to cut back on dividends or, uh, or share buybacks or bonuses paid to top management. So it gives a bit of a cushion that banks should be willing, should be willing to use. So can we? Um, so we have released the countercyclical buffer twice. Once in the market volatility to follow the Brexit referendum in June of 2016, and again just a couple months ago in the COVID-19 stress. So I think it's an important point is in neither, we started from a standard risk environment. So 1% in 20 or on the way to one in 2016 and on the way to two in 2020. Um, so it wasn't the financial system that caused the stress, but it came from somewhere else. But releasing the buffer gave the banks a way of lending so the banks wouldn't be amplifying the stress. I think with respect to the dividend issue that the authors raised in the 2016 release, we said that the um, banks could not use the released capital to increase their dividends. And of course, in 2020, the Bank of England with the strong support of the Financial Policy Committee has convinced the banks that they shouldn't pay any dividends at all to conserve capital and should cut way back on, on cash bonuses to management. We have emphasized that buffers are usable, including the capital conservation buffer. Buffers serve two purposes, building buffers on top of the basic uh, requirements gets capital high enough so that in a stress event, especially for systemically important institutions, they will survive. The taxpayers are not required to step in. The second point is the one I've been emphasizing, that it gives capital that can be drawn down to keep lending flowing and prevent banks from amplifying an already bad event. I think we're in the middle of a test of that second thing. So will the banks actually use the buffers, the management buffers they build up, the extra they've gotten from the counter cyclical capital buffer? Will markets, how will markets view declines in capital and liquidity metrics? And will banks be willing to test uh, how markets might view that? Uh, we've already restricted dividends and buybacks. So the threat of getting into the distribution restriction territory is much less, but still it's not clear how banks are gonna deal with this. We hope and we will encourage them to recognize the externality, the collective action problem that if some of them want to, it, it's in everyone's collective interest that they all continue to loan and use the capital that they've built up. The US in contrast, the UK has been going in the wrong direction. So the stress test is said to be the marginal capital constraint for many large banks. The stress test that has just been discussed by the panel. In 2019, in a paper that Nellie Lang and I published, we showed that in 2019, or in updating that paper, we showed that the stress capital buffer, the capital buffer that fell out of the stress test, fell and fell substantially in 2019. So here we have a, search, a situation in which the unemployment rate was falling. So you'd think the stress would be greater, the capital would be higher. Business leverage was rising, the risk environment was getting worse, and yet the required capital went down. So as I think the paper showed very, very clearly, the starting point in the stress is critical. The Increases we've had in capital and liquidity from the regulatory reform in 2009 have meant that the banks have, have been able to play a constructive role in 2020. I think it's concerning that the 2019 stress test implied that the authorities were okay with that starting point declining, and particularly at a time when the banks were already talking about drawing down their management buffers. So not only was there downward pressure on the starting point, place, 
but the stress test, the changes in stress test regime have weakened the countercyclicality. Nelly talked about this. Much of the countercyclicality that was in the stress test came from the requirement that banks in stress had to pre-fund eight quarters of dividend and share repurchases. Naturally, planned dividends and share repurchases rise in good times and fall in bear times. So the pre-funding requirement gave a bit of a higher capital stress requirement in good times and scaled it back in bad times. That pre-funding requirement has been scaled back to four quarters of dividends from eight or nine quarters of dividends and share buybacks. That's much less, pro, much less counter cyclical. A second point that's been changed in the stress test is the Fed used to impose a soft limit of 30% on dividends a portion of distributions. They've eliminated that. So they've allowed dividends to rise relative to share buybacks. We have seen graphically illustrated in the current environment that it's much easier to cut share repurchases than to cut dividends. And encouraging or allowing dividends to rise relative to share repurchases will be, will, is, is a macro, goes against the counter cyclicality, the macro prudential uh, uh, requirement. And the test now assumes a constant balance sheet rather than the small increase that it had assumed before for bank lending and risk weighted assets. I think it's important that banks be able to fund and capitalize or are capitalized to fund uh, increases in lending, even in a stress environment. And now that's been uh, reduced. So my recommendation, not surprising if you've heard what I've been saying, is that the Fed and the other uh, authorities use the current experience to think very hard to reevaluate what the public interest costs and benefits of the way they were moving and the way they had changed the stress test and the effects that was having on the cyclicality rather than the counter cyclicality of bank capital. I think the US should adopt the framework of dynamic resilience with a positive counter cyclical buffer and standard risk environments. As we've seen, stresses don't always originate in the financial sector. So waiting until the financial sector gives you a signal for, um, uh, for raising the counter cyclical buffer is too late. Things happen, you want to release that buffer. This is the dynamic resilience that Jeremy and others were talking about release the capital buffer in order to give banks more incentive to keep lending. And in the standard risk environment, just to come back to that starting point, uh, you've got to have enough capital to allow that capital be released to have the markets and the microprudential regulators comfortable when capital is released so banks retain their access to, uh, to funding markets and continue to lend. Thank you, and I'll turn it over to Betsy, Betsy Duke. Uh, okay, so thank you, Don. I had forgotten how much fun it was to be the only banker in a room full of academics talking about bank capital in the middle of a bank capital, a, a middle of a financial crisis. But um, am I sharing? I'm not sharing my screen. All right, now it looks like it's sharing. Can you see it? So um, let me start with talking a little bit about the loan programs that are being administered I mean, through Kathy, the bank. We can't, we can't see your slides. So you can't see them. Now. Yeah. Hmm. Is there something I need to do to... Uh... Don, you're fine. And Betsy, if you just look at the share screen button in Zoom. Somehow I now have a very little picture to work with. All right, now. How about that? 
That's good. Now? That's good. Perfect. Okay, super. All right, so I want to start with the loan programs that are currently being administered through the banking system, but that don't really put a lot of strain on bank capital, liquidity, or even um, credit. And so the one that's the, the perfect example of that is the Paycheck Protection Program. And in terms of the origination of these loans, I think it's been a phenomenal effort and um, probably a phenomenal success. $510 billion in four and a half million loans. That's about, I don't know, four or five years of small business lending capacity being put together in a matter of four or five weeks. It took extraordinary effort by both the SBA and the banking system to get it there. And the speed and some of the changing guidance certainly has made it bumpy and there are probably a lot of mistakes and fraud in the thing, but it did get out there. I think you already see regrets in both directions. So borrowers looking at the forgiveness um, application began to worry that rather than getting grants or free money, they were gonna have higher debt and not the revenues to pay it. And then in the public, you had some concerns about companies who weren't deserving of the assistance getting it. But um, so the lending part is actually the easiest part, getting repaid, whether it's through the forgiveness, the post-crisis cash flow, or a government guarantee is going to be the real challenge. Um, just last night, the Senate passed the House bill that will extend the forgiveness terms. So extending from eight weeks to 24, the, the time that you had to spend the money, um, the required payroll spending has been reduced from 75% of the money to 60%, and the date to rehire all employees was moved out till the end of the year. Um, still, small businesses were absolutely horrified when SBA posted the forgiveness application. I, I was actually going by a local restaurant. He was putting inside the four tables he was allowed to serve it outside. And he said, you know, we've just seen it. I, I, I just feel like we have to close up because we're getting deeper and deeper in debt. And there's no way I can see that we're ever going to be able to make money or, or climb out of it. So um, there's that piece. And then just processing those applications. So SBA in the Paperwork Reduction Act estimate estimates three hours to process those applications. I think it's going to take a lot longer than that, both on the bank side and for small businesses, most of whom will have to depend on accountants and attorneys to help them um, complete that paperwork. So the first question is, can the forgiveness be made as simple as the original application? And then the second piece is what happens to the loans that aren't forgiven? So you know, there are going to be a lot of businesses who didn't follow the rules or, or in, some, in one way or another don't have their loans eligible for forgiveness, um, but still are not doing very well. So how far are the banks going to have to pursue those customers to, to get payment in order to um, receive payment from the SBA to, to, for that guarantee? So I think those are some things that, to really think about going forward. Um, the Main Street Lending Program is just getting up and running. The terms, they are past credits, leverage limits at four times or six times EBITDA, senior to or equal to existing debt, and there are restrictions and potential stigma for borrowers. So in reading the terms, it was really kind of hard for me to think about who actually is going to get these loans. It's the old conundrum in banking, which is the borrowers who can qualify for the loans don't want them or can get the loans under, under better terms than are offered in the program. So it's going to be interesting to see who actually signs up for it. I don't see a sign yet that banks are unable or unwilling to maintain the capital and liquidity levels that will support loan demand with acceptable credit quality. But it's hard for me to imagine a scenario where the economy is as bad as some of the, the most stressful scenarios. And yet there's this huge bit of loan, unmet loan demand um, that is, is bank quality credit. And I think the regrets on this program are likely to be bigger and even more severe consequences than in the PPP. So let me turn to the regulatory capital regime and um, just, just point out some things to consider before you get to the conclusion that we need to immediately have all the banks raising additional capital. And the first one is, I'd hate to see us squander the CCAR credibility. If you go back, Don and Nellie in particular, you go back to that SCAP exercise, you'll remember when we were doing that, there was a lot of discussion in the Treasury and the White House and even in some parts of the Fed that the capital hole was so big that the government was going to have to come in and take over different institutions. 
Um, investors were scared of all banks at that point. Counterparties were scared of all banks. And I was scared when we started talking about actually publishing the results of that, I was get ready to dive under the table because I was so afraid that the distinguishing of the banks that needed more capital from the banks that needed less capital was going to cause havoc in, in, in the bank investment market. As it turned out, that was the one thing that calmed everybody down because the capital holes were less than um, the worst case scenarios had assumed. And there was some confidence among investors that they could differentiate between the capital needed between one institution and another. So over time, I think there has been a, a, a considerable um, credibility built up here. The investments, the investors, I think um, their appetite for investing in banks is tied to the transparency of this capital regime. So, um, you know, you've got one time and then if you have a second time, and particularly if you came in right now and said, Bank, all banks have to raise this amount of capital, whether they need it or not, I think that would have some hangover with, with bank investors. CCAR exercise is underway now and um, the original scenarios weren't changed, but I think the firms and the Fed have the opportunity to pressure test the results with the same sorts of additional risks and, and, and unemployment curves that, that you used in, in your in your um, models. Second thing I would say is that I, I'm, I know I'm the only person in the United States, I may be the only person in the world who spent five years on the board of the Fed approving CCAR plans, and then five years on the board of a GSEB approving CCAR plans and capital distributions, and three years talking to bank investors on a very regular basis explaining why we were taking the actions that we were taking. And so, you know, for having seen it in that 360 degrees, I think everybody worries about the same concerns. Everybody has the same concerns and weighs them differently. It's the job of bank management to balance the, um, the regulatory requirements with the investor expectations. But I think investors have come to, um, to understand this regulatory framework and they are not going to reward banks for paying out capital and, and running the, the the capital levels down to um, places which then um, then risk much more severe regulatory action. So if you look at investors right now, they are focused on the institution's ability to earn the dividend first. And I think this is a place where um, you've already seen the largest banks stop their, their repurchase programs. And I think they're also going to have to look at what their realistic earnings um, outlook is for the next four six, nine quarters and adjust their dividends to, to sort of match their current earnings. Everybody's looking at reserve adequacy and that's complicated by you have a new accounting method of, of reserving the, the CESOL, which stands for um, loss expectancy. I don't remember exactly, but it, it's a through the cycle loss reserve methodology um, rather than an incurred loss methodology. So, and then the last thing I would say that is that within the banks, the tools that were developed for CCAR are helpful to constantly forecast earnings and capital levels and, and use those to adjust capital plans in real time. So what is the risk that the st stress losses will be higher than the current modeling? Um, the, the marketable securities on the balance sheet of banks, I would say have been in, to some extent saved by the actions of the Fed in, in the early March because a lot of the swings in the valuations of their securities have been dampened by the Fed's actions. On the consumer side, a lot of the risk in consumer lending is now on the books of the government, whether it's through um, federally guaranteed mortgage lending or in student lending. Um, and if you looked at the banks that seem to have the greatest concern from investors and, and the greatest impact in your models, it was those that were heavily in credit card lending, unsecured lending. Um, debt payment ratios, historically low, government support, tight underwriting. I just don't think the mortgage market is in any way the same as it was in the financial crisis. You don't have that bubble. You don't have subprime lending. Um, there's been really a, a very, very low level of supply for the last 10 years. And looking back in the, the, the 19, early 1990s, you didn't have the kind of losses in mortgages that you had in the last one. So I think all the risk is in commercial. And I think everybody has looked at commercial real estate and commercial looked at it. The only thing I would point out is that in, um, again, in the last two 
loss cycles for banks. The real losses in commercial real estate were in construction lending, much more so than in, in um, income producing real estate. Um, although you know they are granted going to be at the mercy of uh, forbearance on lease payments. So the big thing is in, is in the CNI, is in the, the commercial lending itself. And I think those losses will depend on the arc of shutdowns, how cautious customers are in coming back and the priority in bankruptcy. So I, I do think there's gonna be an extraordinary level of bankruptcy filings. But I think particularly of chapter 11 reorganizations as a tool rather than a problem to be solved because you will have a lot of debt um, extinguishment or debt restructure in chapter 11 and companies will be able to continue to operate. Finally, just quickly on the supplemental leverage ratio, my question is who benefits from this or from the, the exemptions? I thought it from the very beginning, and, and Don, you may remember, was very vocal of the fact that I thought reserve expansions can only be absorbed by the banks, so it has to be permanently exempt, or the Fed's going to have to find another way to fund itself or be constricted by the, the ratio themselves. When we looked at QE2 reserves, they were almost entirely absorbed by foreign banks. I don't know whether that was the case in QE3, and I don't know where those reserves are living today. And then finally, the reserve constraint is in the bank. So particularly national banks that use the exemption will then need OCC approval for any upstream dividends to the holding company. So the holding company will have to get OCC approval to get cash from the bank. I'm not sure how many banks are going to be willing to um, use that exemption with that out there. And I just don't know how much bank balance sheet capacity is necessary for a treasury market functioning. So I would change the, the question a little bit differently. And I would frame it that I don't think more lending can solve the problem of insufficient debt service capacity. I think policy needs to be designed to bring lending and debt service capacity into better balance. Um, over indebted consumers don't spend, over indebted businesses don't hire, don't make capital investments. For consumers, I think the key is in student loans. When I graduated from college, I was worried whether I could afford a car payment. And now students are regularly graduating with student loan payments that are higher than their parents' mortgage payments. And so then you get to the, the businesses, they have to survive before they can hire or rehire. And so, you know, I look at this as not so much an, an, an issue of bank capital, but an issue of, of general business capital to survive and, and um, continue to, to operate. And with that, Nellie, I will give it back to you. Oh, I, do I need to um, unshare? I think we're good. Thank you all for very um, thoughtful comments and um, strong views on all sides. So I don't quite know how to uh, start this. Um, so I'm gonna start a question. Um, I think we have a little less than 30 minutes and I, I have a couple questions that I'll throw out to, and you can choose to respond or not. Um, so in the current, in February, in March, the Fed was in the midst of its 2020 stress test. It made a decision to continue with that stress test. Um, some countries canceled theirs and just said, cut dividends, but the US made a decision that within its capital regime process and rules that it would continue. Um, and then as Betsy said, there's gonna be a little bit of testing around, pushing on uh, models and trying to incorporate more realistic economic and financial assumptions. In your view, what is it that would make them credible when they release results later this month? Um, and will they need to, I mean, what would you want to see to make you comfortable that the banks were sufficiently far from some solvency issue? Um, or do you think that's not possible given the uncertain environment? I'm gonna throw that out there as possibilities and uh, let somebody take a start at that. So I think from my perspective, Nelly, I think what would make me comfortable is if the Fed were listening to Andrew. And uh, 
tested <laughs> against a very slow rebound, may not be their central tendency. We may see something else out of the FOMC when they release their forecasts in a week mm -hmm. or two, but stress tests are about tail events and resilience against the tail. So I think, and that's what really contributed, as Andrew said, to the SCAP thing. It was a very, what it, it turned out to be that it wasn't that much in the tail, but when we did it, we thought it was in the tail and that's what got the credibility. So I think a slow recovery with um, a lot of bankruptcies, et cetera, as Betsy was talking about, are they capitalized for the failures that would occur and the and for the debt restructuring that would occur in that in that environment and just a word about i agree with betsy that a lot of this is about how much credit is being accumulated by households and businesses so there's a big hole and we've chosen to fill it partly with we've chosen to fill it entirely with credit some of the credit is the taxpayers credit through fiscal policy some of it is credit to households and businesses and I think one way of keeping that balance is making sure that fiscal policy fills as much of that hole as possible so that the riskiness of the households and businesses are held down. But we need to see a very, a very adverse scenario to have it get credibility. Anybody? John, I would agree. I think. Um, in publishing the results, if you publish the results for a very different shape for the recovery and said, you know, if this had been the level of severity, this is our estimate of how much different this would have been, then I think that lets everybody, gives everybody a window into how um, much more severe it might be and would inform the decisions that banks made about their capital distributions and the decisions that bank investors make. One, one small sort of addition, uh, sort of building on Betsy's point about the chapter 11, um, there's some very nice research by a guy by the name of Ben Iverson, looking at the effect of congestion in bankruptcy courts on chapter 11 outcomes. And it's pretty strong, it's pretty strong. So, you know, uh, to, to, to sort of, uh, caricature it a little bit, it, it has the feeling of in you know, a garden variety recession, the extra crowding of bankruptcy courts has the effect of effectively doubling loss given default. So the courts get more crowded, the judges just, you know, are overwhelmed, the docket is overwhelmed, people process them faster and less thoughtfully, and that has a big effect. So I think, you know, given, given if, if you believe that that's going to be a big thing this time, I think that's another it's second order to some of Andrew's points, but I think that's another thing that might, one might want to build into the, the stress testing uh, assumptions. Okay. Um, so I want to ask, uh, one of Jeremy's longer term recommendations was about the counter cyclical capital buffer um, and, and using it as more regularly as part of the regime. Um, some other countries have done this. Um, perhaps some other countries have the governance mechanisms in place that allow them to calibrate a time varying buffer more easily. Um, so in the US, in your view, given what you know about the US and the structure, um, do you think it's viable or should regulators just raise capital to be a little bit higher through the cycle? Um, that's my question. <laughs> Is counter cyclical capital viable in the US? Uh, I mean, yes, Andrew. I, I agree 100% with everything that Don said about this. Um, and then you get to sort of a political economy question. You, you know, what, we know what the ideal is. It's exactly yes. what I said. You yes. want to be able to start out high with enough clearance over both the regulatory minimum you're going to be comfortable with in bad times and the market imposed minimum in bad times so that you can draw down a few hundred basis points ideally. Okay. Then the question is, how do you get there? Yeah. For reasons I don't fully understand, it was harder for the Fed to get there in terms of raising than it was for the Bank of England. They have a different institutional structure. The FPC, in some sense, has an affirmative mandate to consider 
to consider this in a way that that, that, that doesn't. Um, you know, it's a little hard if the burden of proof is on you to find affirmative evidence of a sort of credit bubble. Um, so I would just say, given the U.S. evidence that they haven't, were not able to raise it last time around, one wants to think of setting the defaults differently. I don't know exactly how you would do that, but you know, I think that Don's, Don's idea of you know, in quote normal times, risk normal times, it should already be kind of at a somewhat elevated level. So that again, you have something that seems to me like a pretty good. You know, if you don't think you have the ability to kind of do time varying stuff in a very swift way, that seems like a, a good first mm -hmm. place to start. Mm -hmm. I've heard, people, I've heard people from the Fed say um, the banks and their political supporters would be opposed to raising it even to a normal level. And then the people who aren't so friendly with the banks would be opposed to lowering it. But I think they've got to make a decision based on financial stability considerations and the public interest where it needs to be on a permanent basis and the value of reducing it rather than fiddling around as they have with leverage ratios and distribution requirements. So they've had to do, they've gotten space, but they've had to do it in kind of, uh, in kind of temporary forbearance on their regular ratio. And we've done that too in the UK. So we've, we've done both, but I think it's, much more straightforward, much more accountable, much more uh, transparent to lower that counter cyclical buffer. And frankly, in the two instances where the FPC has done it, there's been no blowback. Everybody has recognized that this is a stress event and we're better off with banks lending. There's been no uh, pushback to lowering the capital requirements. So Don, the one caution I would put out on that is that um, first of all, when I was talking to the investors in, in, in the bank, their question over and over and over again was, with current capital regime, can I once again earn X percent on, on my investment? And that was their big question, is can the banks get there? And so the banks are going to have to find a way to earn their cost of capital, regardless of where capital levels are set and how they're, they're measured. And they will find a way to do that. But one of the things that's happened is that the, um, the businesses that are riskiest and are the biggest capital hogs are now moving out of the banking system and into other entities where we don't have any control or even visibility into the resilience. The one that's got me worried right now is mortgage servicing because I don't think the mortgage servicers have the capital or the liquidity to um, support the level of forbearance they're being asked to, to extend to consumers. And it really scares me when you've got an undercapitalized institution getting payments of cash and uh, that they are supposed to use to make payments on behalf of the people making those payments, and they have really strong survival needs for that cash. I think that's, that's the risk of getting the capital requirements to the point where they just um, push the, the, the activity into places where we can't see it or, or, um, or control it in any way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's... Um... That's an important consideration whenever we're thinking about capital regulations is where the, how it moves out. Um, I've been struck by the huge um, deposit flows to banks, the huge loan, the credit line draws on banks in March and April. So in some sense, people have moved back to banks through this, through this episode. Um, I think the issue right now is, well, can the bank stay strong enough so this continues? I mean, they're serving an important role. And I think given the uncertainty about the outlook, where will that, how, how will that play out over the next year or two, given if you don't accept a V-shaped recovery or a quick recovery? So um, I'm gonna ask a question um, about, so this is roughly 10 years after Dodd-Frank. Um, believe it or not. And, um, and so, and we sort of put the banking system to a test. And so far, in my view, they've, they've shown themselves to be resilient. And Jeremy's paper is about 
let's ensure that they're there to support or at least not hold back the recovery. Um, depends how you want to frame that. Um, are we in a good place? Is there something in Dodd-Frank or the regulatory regime that you would change? Or what's, okay, let me change. Is, what's the one thing if you how many could, hours do we have left make a change yeah okay we can't <laughs> within a limited amount of time <laughs> i don't know who wants to start we have 10 uh, minutes for four of you, to, but i'd love to, to hear something from each of you i'm okay. happy to start and i promise not to take the whole 10 minutes okay uh and, and this is really just to follow up on what betsy said because i think that betsy raised a very important point and i think it does go to perhaps the largest hole that's still remaining from Dodd-Frank, which is really what we've done with the non-bank sector, which is not enough. Um, so, so taking the example that Betsy raised about mortgage servicers, you know, one of the issues that we saw happening early on in the crisis was when it was clear mortgage servicers were gonna have a very important role to play in, in helping to get relief to individuals, there was no obvious platform by which the government could reach them. They, they, they don't have, they weren't a counterparty of the Fed. Uh, there was, there was, it wasn't an obvious way. And that raises sort of the, the short term problem is that we have a uh, Federal Reserve system that is really set up to deal with banks and primary dealers. But a lot of the financial system has moved away from that. And we don't even really have a great way to interact with that part of the financial system. And, and, uh, the longer term issue is even in the GFC, that's where there were a lot of problems. So one particular place that would have been nice to see in Dodd-Frank and, and my efforts in this respect in 2009 and 10 were com complete failure. So perhaps we will get another try uh, in, in 2021. But, but uh, what we did in Title VII to move a lot of activity to to swaps clearing houses, the definition of swaps did not have to be as narrow as it was, and it could have included other things. Uh, didn't have to even use the word swaps. I mean, we could have had repo there, uh, for example, and if we had moved bilateral repo, I mean, it's kind of moved in this funny way to one single tri-party place, and, and they have all kinds of problems with that, but if we had moved bilateral repo into a clearing house, similar to the way we did swaps, uh, then we would have the ability to do the same good stuff we've done with swaps, which is turn gross exposures into net exposures. And we would also have, no doubt, a way to reach the mortgage servicers and others like them uh, who, would, who would be interacting with that uh, central clearinghouse. So I think overall, we, we just didn't really spend enough time on non-banks. This is one, way, one place to go after it, but I, I do believe there's others. Great. Well, I'll, 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 if it's okay, I'll pick up on the same thing. I was going to also talk about the non-banks. And, you know, you know, one particular way we were fortunate with this crisis, because this was sort of an alien invasion, right? This was nobody's fault, right? And so the Fed and the Treasury have been able to muster a response in parts of the market that is well beyond what I would have thought. So if you had just said, we're going to have a crisis where like the money market funds are going to come under pressure again, and we're like open end bond funds are going to have massive liquidations. I would have thought, oh my God, that's a terrible scenario. Because I thought that Dodd Frank said, you know, you're not allowed to use the exchange stabilization fund to help out the money market fund sector. Well, if it had been a more moral hazardy crisis, that's what would have happened. And I think we would have had much worse damage. In the event, in this event, the Fed was able to very effectively basically stem the problems in the money market fund sector. We had an what was looking like an incipient run on like junk bond or loan funds. The, the primary and the secondary market credit facilities were extremely helpful in normalizing that. I don't think you can count uh, on those kind of things being rolled out uh, if the crisis is of a different origin. So even though we haven't seen the kind of you know carnage you could have seen in those sectors, that, those were my big among my big worries going in, and would still be my big worries if we don't take the right message um, from this time around, that we just got lucky to have a Fed that was both so aggressive and had, in some sense, the political cover to be aggressive um, the way that they uh, won't always, won't always have. Because as you know, Dodd-Frank really tried to tie their hands on, uh, on a bunch of these. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
So I certainly agree with uh, with Jeremy and Andrew about concentrating in the non-bank sector. I think we've seen pockets of leverage and maturity mismatch that it, it, the deleveraging was very disturbing, including to the treasury market. At the Brookings event a week ago, we had a suggestion of moving that treasury market into central clearing. That might help some, but I think we need a broader examination of all the vulnerabilities that were pointed out by, by this thing beyond just the mutual funds, the margining uh, issues. We didn't really get through the cycle margining, which we, we were trying to get things like that. So I think that's right. If I can put one thing on the table from the first part of your question, what would you change about Dodd-Frank? I'd remove Title I. I'd be honest that to uh, resolve a systemically important institution, the bankruptcy courts aren't going to do it. And it's going to have to be through the FDIC and we might as well not live the lie that it's going to be bankruptcy. I don't know that that would change a lot of things. It might change some of the thinking about liquidity and liquidity requirements um, that are driven by Title I and might themselves be having an adverse effect on market making. So I, I, I think uh, we need to have a resolution regime that doesn't have moral hazard in it, that bails in uh, creditors, longer term creditors, um, but is effective and we need to, and it's hard and uh, we need to concentrate on that. So that would be my one, one suggestion for Dot Frank. You don't want to lose all of Title One, Don, right? Just the the, the assumption of bankruptcy is the primary. That's right. Yeah, right. Title One bankruptcy. Right. 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 <laughs> I thought Title Two was resolution. It is, but Title yeah. One also gives us the FSOC, for example. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, and I and, think we've yet and, to be seen how effective that piece of Title One. <laughs> <laughs> it gives enhanced standards for the large systemically yeah. ins institutions as well. So you probably don't want to lose it all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Betsy. Well, again, I would say outside of the, the banking system, all the financial products, and you know, you still have, again, mortgage servicers will go through chapter 11 and they will have a ton of consumer funds under their control. We haven't yet seen the full expansion of these technology-based lenders, these fintechs, but th as they yeah. get a bigger, bigger piece of financial services, the, the regulation of the, the safety and soundness of fintechs is going to be also incredibly important. And so, you know, it's sort of the thing when if you can't sell what you want to, you sell what you can. I think we're in a situation where if you can't regulate everything you want to, you regulate what you can. And um, just continuing to press down on regulation of the banking system, I don't think is helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think we are at our time. Actually, I have one, one, one minute. So just, I want to come back to the banking sector as the very last question. Okay, so you get 30 seconds on this one. Um, <laughs> so I think all believe whatever, you know, we have different views about how quickly the economy may recover, but it's, it's going to be painful and it's going to be long and we're going to have low interest rates for a long time. What is your view for the banking sector in this, in this kind of economy? And do we need to change regulations? And you only have, I think, 30 seconds to answer this, <laughs> but it is a longer, just sort of getting past. I think they're gonna be in a low rate economy. Is this fundamentally change their models, their business model? Is this for me? Sure, you start, Betsy. Okay. So I think it's definitely gonna put pressure on bank earnings. There's no way that it doesn't put pressure on bank earnings um, for sure. So, and then the second piece is I don't think bank examiners, much different than the bank regulators, but bank examiners can help themselves from not really being quick to classify loans and put restrictions on banks based on the possibility that those loans will go bad and that will, definitely um, put throw cold water on the bank's willingness to work with borrowers into the, um, 
into recovery. And then if I could just use up the rest of the time, Please. the biggest danger in a workout is not lending enough money. And Don, I don't know if you remember this, but when we had the meeting to decide whether or not we were going to lend $85 billion to AIG, we had a long conversation. This was the collateral we had. We had, you know, it would use up every bit of our authority, but we could lend this $85 billion. And the one question I had was, is it enough money? Because if you lend the $85 billion and you can't lend the money to get to the other side, to get where it's going to take to have it repaid, then you have lost that, that money. So, so you can't go halfway in. You've got to go all the way in to get businesses to recover so that they can hire consum consumers and then consumers can, can spend. And I think that's the only way we get out of it. Sorry to steal the last 30 seconds. Great. No, that's fine. Does anyone want to add anything on uh, low rates or are we good? Okay, well, I just want to thank you all for joining and Jeremy and co-authors for writing a very interesting, thought-provoking paper for this discussion. Um, hopefully, we're, I wrote down every idea for how to change Dodd-Frank <laughs> and, and uh, hopefully that we'll, we'll be using that kind of list to, to uh, inform the public discussion of this. So thank you again. Appreciate it all. Thank you. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.